Welcome to QOD number 34, where we will start by talking about the meaning of the equilibrium constant K, and then we will uh, talk a little bit more about calculating uh, the value of the equilibrium constant K, and then we'll talk in the end at, uh, briefly about heterogeneous equilibria and some terms that we don't include in the equilibrium expression. But let's start by talking about what does the value of k mean? And, and I guess I should just quickly say, what are the possible values of k? It can't be negative uh, because uh, you can't have a negative concentration. It can't be zero because you always have to have, at equilibrium by definition, you're going to have some concentration of everything, which means it also can't be infinity. So it's going to be some value between zero and infinity. The midpoint is actually one, right? So if you had an equal amount of products and concentrate and, and reactants, then you would have a ratio that would give you one. And so the value of K really is a question of what is the value, what is the meaning of the value of K relative to the number one? If it's more than one, what does that mean? If it's less than one, what does that mean? And by how much? That'll tell us something about the relative amounts of reactants and products. Remember, K is the ratio of products to reactants. I've simplified it here. It doesn't include any exponents or anything like that. But at its core, it's a ratio of products to reactant. And so it's going to tell us something about how much product or reactant is left in the pot um, at equilibrium. So if K is much larger than 1, then we would use the term to say that that is a product-favored reaction. And that is to say that products predominate at equilibrium. Remember, it's a ratio of products to reactants. And so if it's much greater than one, that means we've got much more product than reactants. We've got a much larger numerator than a denominator. And furthermore, we would say, because the products always appear on the right-hand side of the equation, we would say that the equilibrium lies to the right if K is much greater than one. Conversely, if K is much less than one, we would say that that is a reactant-favored reaction. Remember, if it's much less than one, that means that the denominator is much larger than the numerator. The denominator is the reactant, and therefore we would say that lies to the left, or that is a reactant-favored reaction. Here are some basic rules of thumb when it comes to thinking about what's present in the equilibrium mixture based on certain values of K. It's generally the case that if K is greater than 100, then the equilibrium mixture is essentially going to consist of products. If K is less than 1 one hundredth, less than 10 to the minus 2, which is simply the reciprocal of 100, then we would say that the equilibrium mixture is essentially going to consist of reactants. And then if it's somewhere between uh, 0.01 and 100, then we would expect to find appreciable or measurable amounts of both reactants and products at equilibrium. But just remember, these are only generalizations. And there are examples um, that we'll see later on of fairly small equilibrium constants where there's still significant amounts, significant amounts of both reactants and products um, in the equilibrium mixture. OK, let's go on and talk some more about calculating K. Uh, one of the, what we've done already uh, in class is practicing calculating K when we knew all the concentrations at equilibrium. So we could construct the equilibrium constant expression and simply plug in a series of equilibrium concentrations or partial pressures that we were given. Um, it's also possible to do a calculation of K when we don't know all of the equilibrium pressures or concentrations, but we know all the original concentrations or pressures, and we know at least one uh, final concentration or pressure. So let's see what an, a problem like that would look like. And here we go. We have this equilibrium in which we're mixing uh, hydrogen and iodine to give hydrogen iodide. I've got the balanced e uh, equilibrium equation here. And here's our data. We have a closed system. Uh, it just happens to be at 448 degrees Celsius. This is just the problem that I got. Um, and so the uh, initial concentration of hydrogen is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. The initial concentration of iodine is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Uh, there is no initial concentration of HI, so that's going to be 0. 
we allow that to reach equilibrium, and then we analyze the equilibrium mixture, and we find that the concentration of the product, HI, is 1.87 times 10 to the minus 3. So to solve this problem, we're going to use an ice table, and you have seen, oh, so it's going to ask, it's asking us to calculate the value of Kc, therefore, at this temperature. We're going to use an ice table, which you've seen already in some of the stuff we've done with kinetics. And so I'm simply, I've got my balanced equation here. I have generated an ice table. Remember, ice stands for initial change and equilibrium. And I'm putting in the data that the problem gave me. It gave me an initial concentration of hydrogen. It gave me an initial concentration of iodine. It, uh, we're assuming, because it didn't say otherwise, that the initial concentration of the product is zero and it gives me uh, the final concentration of the product, 1.87 times 10 to the minus three. Well, what can I figure out from that? Well, what I can figure out from that is the change in the HI concentration, because it started at zero and went up to 1.87 times 10 to the minus three, and therefore I can write in the value of the change in the product concentration as positive 1.87 times 10 to the minus three. Now here's where we have to remember something that a lot of people have been forgetting and not remembering when we've been talking about these ice tables in regard to kinetics is that the change in concentration of all of these species is going to be related by their coefficients in the balanced equation. And because the HI has a coefficient of two and the iodine and the hydrogen each have a coefficient of one, then their change is gonna be equal to exactly half of the change in concentration of the HI. And so we can simply put those in. And because they are reactants whose, re, whose concentrations are going down, we give them negative signs. But 9.35 times 10 to the minus fourth is one half of 1.87 times 10 to the minus three. And we get that because these have a coefficient of one and these have a coefficient of, this has a coefficient of two. And so they're changing by half of what this is changing by. Well, now we can subtract the change from the initial and that gives us the final concentrations and now we have the final concentrations of everything. We go back from our balanced equation and we write the equilibrium constant expression. It's the product raised to the power of its coefficient divided by the, uh, the concentrations of the reactants raised to the power of their coefficient, which is one in each case. We plug in the numbers that we just generated uh, on the previous slide and then we solve that and we get an equilibrium constant for this reaction of 51. Okay, I've walked you through that. Let's try another one. I'm gonna, you actually can have the opportunity if you'd like to turn the uh, video off and work and scratch this out on a piece of paper and then check to see if you got it right. But this is the decomposition of sulfur trioxide to give sulfur dioxide plus oxygen. And in this problem, I've got a closed system at 1000 K Again, this is just a problem that I got from the book, so I don't get to choose the temperature. Um, and it's initially simply charged with, the, with 0.5 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide. That's all that's in there, is 0.5 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide. I allow that to reach equilibrium, and when I analyze the equilibrium mixture, it shows that the partial pressure of the sulfur trioxide is now 0.2 atmospheres. So I started with 0.5 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide. It has gone to equilibrium. Now I've got 0.2 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide. So I'm gonna calculate Kp for this reaction. So again, this is the point at which you could turn this off if you like and do the problem and then turn it back on. Well, I'm going to take my, uh, I'm going to take my ice table and I'm gonna populate it uh, just like I did with the last one. This time, instead of concentrations, we're talking about partial pressures. The initial partial pressure of sulfur trioxide was 0.5 atmospheres, and there was none of either of the products present. And then the problem told us that in the end, there was 0.2 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide left. So once again, the thing that I can immediately calculate is the change in concentration of the sulfur trioxide. It's gonna be final minus initial, and therefore that's negative 0.3 atmospheres. Now I can fill in these two 
uh, fields based on that number, mindful that they, these numbers are going to be related by the coefficients in the balanced equation. So this is going to go up. The sulfur dioxide is going to go up by the same pressure that the sulfur trioxide went down. That's going to be plus 0.3. And because the oxygen has a coefficient of one instead of two, it's going to change by half as much. So that's going to be plus 0.15. And therefore, since those initial, con those initial partial pressures were zero, the final partial pressures are simply equal to the change. And now I have the equilibrium partial pressures of everything. I can go back and write my Kp expression which is the partial pressure of, of sulfur dioxide squared times the partial pressure of oxygen over the partial pressure of sulfur trioxide squared. I can plug in those partial pressures that I had uh, from the ice table on the, on the last slide. And when I evaluate that, I get a Kp of 0 0.338. Okay, those are the sorts of problems you might see um, regarding init knowing initial concentrations or pressures and one final concentration or pressure and calculating K on that basis. Talk for just a moment about heterogeneous equilibrium. Here's an example of a heterogeneous equilibrium. It simply means an equilibrium in which the components are not all in the same phase. So far, we've been talking about equilibria in which everything is a gas, or everything is in some aqueous solution or something like that. Here's a heterogeneous equilibrium because I've got a saturated sodium chloride solution. So that means I've got, I have got sodium chloride dissolved in water. I've got the maximum saturated possible solution. So it is in equilibrium with undissolved sodium chloride um, sitting down on the bottom. Now, there are other types of heterogeneous equilibrium. We could have solid gas, we could have liquid gas, but what we want to focus on here is a heterogeneous equilibrium in which one component is a solid and the other component is typically uh, an aqueous solution. I want you to think of, for a second about what might happen if I add some more sodium chloride to this. I've already got a saturated solution. So adding more sodium chloride isn't going to make more sodium chloride dissolve. It's already saturated. And so if you can think about that, once I've got a saturated solution, the amount of sodium chloride that's in there uh, doesn't affect its solubility, doesn't push the equilibrium one way or the other. The other thing to think about here is that sodium the solid sodium chloride doesn't really have a concentration in the sense that we would consider calculating a concentration, it's not part of the solution. Um, and so we can't, if you were left to sort of put its concentration into an equilibrium constant expression, you'd be at a loss as to how to do that. And so the upshot of all this is that we don't include solids in equilibrium constant expressions. If a solid appears in a balanced equation, we simply leave it out of the equilibrium constant expression. So let's take a look at some examples. This is another instance in which you could stop the video if you wanted. I'm asking, I've given you three different uh, heterogeneous equilibria here. These are both what are called solubility equilibria. Uh, silver chloride is not particularly soluble in water, but it will dissolve a little bit. Aluminum hydroxide is not particularly soluble in water, but it will dissolve a little bit. And then here's an equilibrium in which if you've got calcium carbonate and calcium oxide together in a same closed container, uh, you, will get, you will get decomposition of the calcium carbonate to calcium oxide plus CO2. So I'm asking you to write uh, Kc expressions for each of these three. So if you'd like, you can turn this off and then turn it back on. Okay, so the Kc expression for the first one is simply going to be concentration of silver ion times the concentration of chloride ion. There's no exponents, so that's each to the first power. We do not put the solid in, so there's no denominator. So Kc is simply equal to the concentration of silver times the concentration of chloride. For the next one, we once again are going to leave the solid out, so there's no denominator. It's the concentration of aluminum times the concentration of hydroxide cubed because the coefficient here is three. So that is the Kc expression for this reaction. 
And then finally, the last one, both the reactant and one of the products are solids. There's only one component of the reaction that's not a solid. And therefore, the Kc expression for this reaction would simply be uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide. Let's talk about one more thing that we do not include in equilibrium constant expressions, and that has to do when we're talking about aqueous equilibrium. Um, when you have a reaction in which water is the solvent, that is, an, it's an aqueous equilibrium, but water is also one of the components of the equilibrium, that is, something that's participating in the equilibrium reaction, the concentration of water doesn't change much. I think I've mentioned to at least one of the classes the idea of what is the concentration of water in water, and, it, and it's equal to 55.6 molar. That is one liter of water contains 1,000 grams of water, and when you divide that by 18 grams per mole, it contains 55.6 moles of water per liter of water. And therefore, if you've got an aqueous solution, the concentration of water is 55.6. Well, in pretty much any aqueous reaction we can think of in which water is also a participant in the equilibrium, its concentration is going to change by some really, really tiny amount, which relative to 55.6 is completely negligible. And therefore, when water is both a component of the equilibrium expression and the solvent, that is an aqueous equilibrium in which water is a component, we don't include water in the Kc expression. And so here's one example. Uh, write the Kc expression for this reaction. This is the reaction of when you put the weak acid, hydrofluor hydrofluoric acid into water, it will react with water uh, to protonate the water to give you a hydronium ion uh, and also a fluoride ion. So go ahead and write the Kc expression for this. So this would be the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction. It's going to be the concentrations of the products raised to the power of their coefficients, which in each case is one. So it's just uh, hydronium times fluoride over HF because we don't include water in the equilibrium constant expression. Well, that gets us to the end. I'm glad you're, I'm sure you're happy to have one that didn't last 25 minutes. Um, so what are the sort of things you might expect to see on a QOD? Well, I would certainly expect you to understand something about um, the magnitude of the equilibrium constant and what that means with regard to relative amounts of products and reactants in, con in solution at equilibrium or present at equilibrium. And I would also, it'd probably be a good thing to give you a question about one of these uh, things that we've just been talking about, either a heterogeneous equilibrium and writing the expression for that and to leave out uh, any solids, or writing an expression for an aqueous uh, for an aqueous equilibrium that contains water, remembering to leave the water out. So enjoy the rest of your long weekend, and we will see you for the QOD.